So, uh, first of all, thank you, Natalie, for coming, uh, well, for being on Skype. Unfortunately, you couldn't make it today with the Brighton, but um, well, really, thank you for coming along, um, virtually anyway. Um, <laughs> First of all, we'd just like to ask you to um, talk about a f few topics. Obviously, we wanted you to do the keynote speech today. Um, like a few topics that we pointed out on the on our schedule was um, like, why do the main parties tend to ignore younger voters? Um, should we lower the voting age to 16? And why should young people vote? If you could talk about that first of all, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Okay, great. It's great to be with you eventually. Uh, and I'm really sorry that um, I, I can't personally. Uh, I think the problem that I'm getting interested in saying is feedback, which is a bit of a tech problem. I don't know if anyone will be able to do anything about that. Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit crackly there. Um, hmm. Shall I continue? Can we do anything on our side? Oh, you didn't catch that there, sorry. Uh, how's it going at your end? I mean, can you hear clearly? Um, it's it's it is it is slightly crackly, but we we do we do, we are getting the general All gist right. of what you are saying. All right, I'll, I'll try not to talk too fast, <laughs> which isn't my natural game, but I'll try. <laughs> um, so, why does voting matter for young people? Well, I suppose I have to start where I often start, which is with talking about how I have to say, as a 48-year-old, on behalf of my generation, to your generation, sorry, because we've made a right mess of things. Uh, you look at you know the economic crisis that we're still in, the in, the social crisis of inequality. So many people struggling to find a job they can build a life on. So many people depending on food banks, uh, and of course the environmental crisis. The state, the issue is not just about climate change, but biodiversity loss, the state of our oceans, the state of our fresh water and our soils. Um, and what I would say to everybody is that this is. We created that problem, you've inherited it, but we've all got to get together and solve all of these problems. And it's possible to do that. And we can build a society that works for the common good, where everybody has enough within the limits of our one planet. And to do that, what I'd say, first of all, is that everybody should do politics. Politics shouldn't be something done to you, it should be something that you do. And actually, I was, I was last night in um, Norwich uh, talking to a, a lovely woman who lives in a very Tory part of North Norfolk. Uh, and she said to me, well, I always vote because my grandmother was a suffragist and she fought for the vote. But what I really do politics with is through the Women's Institute. And you can do politics in all kinds of different ways through all sorts of different societies and organisations or on your own by starting petitions or whatever. But ultimately, lots of decisions are still made, whatever you're doing as politics, in your local council, in Westminster, in Europe. And so it's really critically important that you engage with elections, with your council, with Westminster, with Europe, because that's where the decisions are made. And that's why I think you know, everybody should vote. And I guess most people will have heard the Russell Brand uh, message, which, to paraphrase, don't vote, it only encourages them, or something like that. Now, I would say that doesn't work quite simply, because if you don't vote, if you simply stay away from the polling station, if you don't register to vote, then you're going to be counted as the people who are happy enough with how things are that they didn't bother to go and express their view. That's what you're going to be counted as, happy enough with how things are. So I kind of suspect I'm probably talking to a room full of people interested in politics. So I bet, or I hope, that most of you are registered to vote already. Uh, if you're not, and please share with your friends, you know, just Google register to vote. You can do it online, it should only take a few minutes. The one potential stumbling block is you've got to have your national insurance number, but that only you can find out the student loan papers or you can find that if you ring up the student loan company. So there's a solution to that. And yeah, really urge all of your friends, relatives, everyone you know to say make sure they registered to vote. Because one of the things that I think is really possible in the coming election, and the Scots have shown us the way. And, you know, they had the great advantage that voting started at 16 in the Scottish referendum. But what we can do is actually see, you know, the kind of engagement with politics that happened in the Scottish referendum. There's a test for this. You know, in Scotland, there were many reports of strangers, British strangers at bus stops, talking about politics. And, you know, if you get to that level of engagement, that's the test what we want to get to in this election. 
And if we do that, then you know we could see something like the Scots, 97% of eligible people enrolled to vote, 85% of people voting, when in normal general election you see 60 or 65% voting. And really critically importantly, young people voting at the same kind of proportion as the over 60s do. And you know, one of the questions you asked was, you know, why do many, the, the largest political parties not take much notice of young people? And you know, sadly, there's a very practical answer to that, which is they just think that young people don't vote. I think what you should do, however you're going to vote, or even if you don't feel like you can vote for anyone, and obviously I'd like you to vote Green, if you don't think you can go vote for anyone, still register, still go into the polling station and write a rude word on the ballot paper. Uh, and But make sure that you've registered your views and in future no one in politics will be able to ignore you, the young people. Thank you. I do have one more question from myself, and I'm sure a lot of people would want to know in the room as well. Um, the Green Party are in the news an awful lot lately um, due to the Green Surge, yep. which is what's been called. Where, where, where is the Green Surge coming from? Like, where, is, where are a lot of the memberships coming from? Is it concentrated or is it national? Um, the, yes, the Green Surge, and yes, that is the hashtag. Uh, and latest news from the Green Surge front is yesterday morning we passed 51,000 members in England and Wales alone. Um, it's actually very broadly spread right across the country. It's a very pretty even spread. I think, I don't have any data on this, but I think there's a very large group of students among them. The proportion of young Greens in our total membership has doubled since the Green Surge started. But I think there's also a lot of people who've always considered themselves small G Greens, but now think this is the time to really get involved in party politics. And there is also, you know, perhaps at the other end of the spectrum, I know someone whose 94-year-old grandmother opened the door to them and said, you know what, I've just joined the Green Party. I think that would be brilliant, like. <laughs> um, we'd also like to get a few questions from the audience. So um, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask Natalie? Um, lady over there. Hello. Um, um, I'm sorry, which way is that? Uh, hello there. Um, I'd oh, yeah. like to... Um, I just wondered what, how the Green Party felt about the privatisation of the um, NHS, NHS uh, referring to um, you know, people starting to pay for it, that sort of thing. It's become quite a hot topic. Um, yes, and to start off with in talking about the NHS, I'd state one very simple principle, which is that we should say that the profit motive has no place in healthcare. We should have a publicly owned and publicly run NHS, and all of the services should be absolutely free, including prescriptions and eye tests, things that aren't free at the moment. And what we've seen, as you've alluded to, is, is a real a rush to privatisation that started under the previous government and has continued with this government. Uh, and we have a situation where, um, even where you haven't got privatised services, the whole NHS has been organised on the basis of a market. So you can actually have a publicly owned hospital being commissioned to provide services by a publicly owned clinical commissioning group. But they treat each other like customer uh, and, and, and seller. And that ends up adding massive costs to the NHS. So you know, a lot of the debate you're hearing, particularly from the two largest parties, about we're going to offer X billion for the NHS, we're going to offer Y billion for the NHS. You know, it's very sterile and it's not going to take us anywhere. What we have to say is, first of all, we have to stop pumping money into private financial initiatives, PFI schemes that are costing a heap that are very often owned by companies that are tax evading companies. We have to get back to running the NHS publicly owned and publicly run and absolutely maintain that free healthcare. And one, one of the things that's really worth focusing on, because there's really no answer to it, is we've seen a rush towards an American style healthcare system. But actually, in America, they use twice the percentage of GDP on healthcare that we do, and their outcomes are far worse. You know, it's a, Awful model that's nothing to copy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Anyone else got a question? Yeah, <laughs> the back, there, yeah. um, there's been a lot of debate at the moment about a uh, leaders' debate, actually, uh, televised leaders' debate about who should be able to take part, whether Labour are afraid of the Greens or the Conservatives are afraid of UKIP. Do you think that um, any party who has a big following should be able to take part in a televised debate? Uh, just to espouse their own views and debate whether uh, the big issues with them. Mm 
Well, where we are at the moment, and I think it's fairly settled, you never know with these things, but I think it's pretty settled, is they're talking about two debates involving seven people, uh, and that will be um, to Tory, Labor, Lib Dem, uh, UKIP, Green, SNP and Plaid, and then one debate that will simply be Tory versus, versus Labor. Uh, and I think that's a pretty sensible solution, actually, because it really does re reflect the political composition of Britain, the fact that there's huge anti-austerity forces, the Green Party, the SNP and Plaid, that reflects lots of British opinion, and things just won't be heard there otherwise. But I think more broadly, it's, it's a real reflection of how much of our politics is really out of date and hasn't caught up with the 21st century. You know, in places like Germany, they actually have a, 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 a law that explains how the debates will be, will be structured. It's not down to the broadcast to the side. There's a clear framework that everyone understands. And that's a framework, of course, that reflects a multi-party system. Whereas what we've done is last time we very much imported an American presidential style debate, which has really got us in a mess this time. Uh, and... You know, it's really time after this, as with so much else, to really look at our constitutional arrangements and think again. And that's why actually the Green Party, we're calling for a people's constitutional convention to actually start with a blank sheet of paper and think about how everything in our society is arranged in terms of our political settlement. Um, and in terms of the debates, you know, one of the things that I'm very much looking forward to of where we've got to now is the fact that we're practically going to see gender balance in these debates. Three women uh, and four men. And I really hope that that's going to inspire lots of women, particularly young women around the country, to think politics, yeah, that's something I'm going to do. So uh, th th there's a takeaway message there as well. I was just wondering if you could elaborate on your claim that it shouldn't be a crime to join ISIS. Right, OK. Um, well, this is um, a misunderstanding. Um, what uh, I have said you know, very loudly and clearly quite a few times recently is that, yes, if you join ISIS, Al-Qaeda or similar organisations, you are supporting, in some way, helping inciting violence, and that should be a crime. Um, where all of this arose from is there's, there's a line in the Seas for a Sustainable Society, which was um, the policies of the Green Party democratically made by the members which continues election after election. So it's separate from the manifesto that we'll be launching in March that will set out our, our position for this election. But the line that, that's in, in the policies, the long-term document, uh, actually relates back to the era of the ANC and the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. And so there's a line then that was basically saying, if you want to support belong to the ANC peacefully, uh, then that, should, that shouldn't be a crime. But just to be absolutely clear, you know, belonging to ISIS, supporting ISIS or Al-Qaeda in any way should be a crime because that means you're supporting violence. Um, you've mentioned, obviously, the, with the Green Party surge in party membership, I was wondering, as a 17-year-old student, what benefits does party membership to any party actually have for me? Okay, um, well, in terms of the Green Party, I've already mentioned one of the key things, which is you have the chance to make Green Party policy. The way this works is any four members of the party can actually propose um, a, a policy which goes to our conference that any member can attend. Uh, so you can actually influence the policy of a, a, what I will say is a major political party. Um, so that's that's one benefit. Of course, it also gives you a chance you'll be you've joined up in the Green Party party a member of your local party so that gives you a chance to influence what your local green party is doing whether it's you know campaigning locally about making the seats the streets safer improving recycling making your council a living wage council whatever it is once you remember you have in the green party a wholly democratic say in, in terms of the direction that the party's taking at all kinds of different levels and of course you can also stand for election um which is something you know you might not be able to do it now, but you'll be able to do it uh, within the next 12 months. We've got any other questions? We'll stay, go to this side of the room, see if there's any other. We've got one there? Okay, we'll take the lady's question over. Um, I just wonder what your opinion is on the Barnet formula and English votes um, for English laws. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, in terms of the Barnett formula, um, I kind of assume that everyone knows what it means, but just in case what we're talking about is the way in which money 
is allocated um, to um, nations within Britain. Um, I think it's, you know, it, it, there's a whole area there that's related constitutional issues around Scotland. But in short, what we need is, is a much, uh, a super bar, if you like, a kind of allocation that's much more regional and much more local and much more needs. So what we've seen in Britain is power is focused at the centre, focused at Westminster, and so is money. And then Westminster allows money and power sometimes to trickle down out to different kind of regions. And I mean, I was, I was up in Carlisle having a discussion about um, the whole sort of constitutional settlement. And the people in Carlisle said to me, well, you know, Glasgow is much closer to where the Westminster is. It all just seems very distant and far away. <laughs> And so I was talking about the People's Constitutional Convention. What we think should happen is that we should basically restructure, turn everything upside down, and say that power should rest locally with citizens in their local communities, and so should the money and resources. And then only as much as is necessary should be reflected upwards uh, and eventually get to Westminster, perhaps through a regional structure as well. And, and in terms of on the basic sort of simple English votes for English laws, I think it's a case that um, you could make a real mess by creating two separate governments operating in Westminster, you know, on different days or something with the Parliament. It really is too late to tinker with the whole system in Westminster. We haven't seen significant reform there in a hundred years. The last big reform in Westminster was women getting the vote. That was 1918. We're coming up to the hundredth anniversary of that. Rather than just tinkering around trying to make a failed system work, we should start again. And, you know, we think what that looks like. It should have proportional representation. It certainly shouldn't have an unelected upper house. But one of the keys is the power and the money staying locally as much as it possibly can. Thank you. Could I elaborate on that last suggestion there about localised, about the money? Um, would you argue that a federalist system in the UK would work in a more regional perspective? Um, I, think, I think that's probably you know, inventing things from other areas. I think where we've really got to start is, is power resting locally. And you know, look at, looking at the other extreme of this, something that's probably worth mentioning, many people in the room may already know about it, um, about the proposed EU-US free trade deal known as TTIP. Now that's something that would actually cut power not even with government, but with big multinational companies. Uh, and that's something that you, know, you have to operate at kind of different levels. If you're going to take on the big multinationals, you, know, you actually need to make sure that the EU at some levels has power for that. So it's about having power existing at the right level and decisions made at the appropriate level uh, for each kind of, kind of different decision. Um, so it has to be a flexible system. It has to be an intelligent system. Mm -hmm. Do we have any more questions? Anyone? Gentlemen, over there. Okay. I've heard about the government will start cracking. Uh, in the near future. So what is your view about it and how to stop them cracking under our homes? Okay, probably most people know that the Green Party is absolutely opposed to, to fracking. And actually, interestingly, in Scotland, we've just seen a moratorium announced on, on fracking, as we've got moratoriums in bans in much of the rest of Europe. Um, and there's three really strong arguments against fracking, one of which is, first of all, overwhelmingly, we have to stop using fossil fuels. We have to deal with the fact we've got a massive carbon bubble. Our financial sector is underpinned. Uh, by valuations of companies based on fossil fuels that can't be taken out of the ground. So fossil fuels is the wrong direction, and it's a distraction that's particularly distracted this government of ours. Also, you know, we, what we need to be doing is going for renewables, going for energy conservation. And you know, there is real evidence, and that's why people very much don't want it under their homes in their communities, that fracking will cause um, known environmental impacts, lots of lorry movements, lots of water use and also potentially a um, you know, really risky spills, dam damage the environment, long-term damage that really can't be fixed. And in terms of what you can do about it, I, what I would say is, you know, all the usual stuff, petitions, get online, share the info around. Um, write to your MP at a very basic level, tell them you're not happy about it, because this one's really resting on a knife edge, and it's definitely an environmental argument that we have to win, and we really can win. Over there. I know you keep talking about uh, not using fossil fuels, 
But I have a bit of a concern about wind farms because not only they are wrecking the countryside and spoiling the views, but it's like when it is windy they are switched off because like when it is windy I should get a 10% electrical discount. <laughs> Okay. I think in, in, term, in terms of the issues around views, um, uh, that's very much a matter of opinion. But also one of the key things I think is what we need to do is rather than have big multinational companies coming in and inflecting wind farms on communities, what the Green Party wants to encourage is very much community ownership of renewable energy technologies. And you know, in, in, on the continent, in most countries, communities can compete to get wind farms because they've got a real stake in them, they get a real return, and they have a real say in where they go, how they're organised. And I think, you know, you can just imagine, we've just seen actually Borkham, where there was the anti-fracking protest. They've just launched and just switched on first energy generation for a renewable energy company that's based in Borkham, that's generating energy for Borkham. And everyone's welcomed that, or pretty well everyone's welcomed that and embraced that. <coughs> so that's what we, we need to do, is have that community-owned energy. And maybe if, if, if a community you know, has lots of wind resource, would like to have its own wind farm, would like to have the benefits flowing down into the community, and maybe they, they decide, you know, over there, that might be the best place for the wind farm in terms of energy generation, but that hill over there, we don't value that view so much, and we'd rather have it over there. That's the kind of things that you can see happening if you've got community-owned energy, rather than big multinational companies coming in. And, and in terms of the point that you talked about in terms of wind farms being switched off even when it's windy, what we've really got to do is invest in what's known as a smart grid. So actually see a situation where um, when there's lots of wind blowing, maybe you've got a plug between your freezer and the wall and it runs, energy's cheap, you get your freezer down 20 degrees colder than it normally is and then the wind stops blowing, the freezer sits there for two days, gradually still being as cold as it needs to be and you don't use energy, any energy. You save money. We're using energy when it's available. It's a different kind of flexible energy system that we need to go towards. Okay. The gentleman over here. This will be the last question, by the way, sorry. <clears throat> While we've talked about uh, green issues already, I want to reflect on one of your other policies. Why should prisoners get the right to vote? Mm -hmm. Okay, because um, I believe that the human rights and um, civil rights are a, something that applies to everybody in society. And, and this is one of the cases where, you know, human rights apply to the hard cases as well as the easy ones. Now, I think, and what we're saying and what indeed the, the European institutions are saying is that um, judges should have the right to take away votes from anyone if they think that should be part of the punishment. Now, I think the obvious area for this would be if you've committed electoral fraud and been sent to jail for it, I think it's quite reasonable for you to lose your vote. But... Otherwise, you are, and nearly everyone in prison is going to come out of prison again. You're a member of society even in prison, and you shouldn't lose a basic human right uh, just because you are in prison. We have to respect people's rights, both the difficult cases as, as well as all of the easy ones. And, and that's, you know, we, Britain, are responsible, we're met, you know, we've been celebrating the anniversary of the Magna Carta, Lots of the ideas that underpin human rights actually started in Britain. A really proud history of that, just as we have, we have a proud history of offering asylum to political refugees from around the world. And those are both things we should respect, celebrate, and continue. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much again, Natalie. Um, just one more point. Um, the Green Party Conference, I believe, is in Bournemouth this year. Am I correct? Or uh, I don't know if we've decided about autumn. In spring, we're in Liverpool. We've just very excitingly shifted venues um, to the biggest, the biggest conference centre in Liverpool. Uh, we can take 1,800 people in the main auditorium. So anyone who wants to join the Green Surge, you can join in and come along to conference. Finally, um, how, how's the election plan going? <laughs> the election plan is going at great speed. I was in Norwich uh, yesterday, uh, which is one of our target seats, and last week I was actually in Bristol. And Bristol West you know, is a very uh, hot prospect for us. 
you don't just have to believe me on that. You can uh, listen to Ladbrokes, who slashed our odds from 100 to 1 to 5 to 1 in one go. We're now down to 7 to 2. Um, and I was actually at Bristol University. You know, a lot of very enthusiastic student members there. Um, things are just growing at enormous speed in the Green Party. We've got you know, huge opportunities. We can see a new kind of politics in Britain, that, but the future not looking like the past. And goodness knows we need to see a new kind of politics. And thank you, everyone, today for listening and for your time. Yeah, thank you very much, Matt. Like, everyone was looking forward to speaking to hear you speak, so the fact that you came on Skype is fantastic. Obviously, it's not exactly the same as you being here, but it's still, it's still worked. And again, thank you very much for taking, taking out, obviously, time out your busy schedule to, to speak to us all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah.